All right. All right, Z, I'm back with you. So I see Natalie and Nan joined us. Welcome. We're glad you're with us, everybody. Awesome. Yep. Thank you for joining in. All Vicar right. Christian. All right, Z. I'm back. Pastor with you. Scott, welcome, guys. Okay. Hope you're doing well. I see Natalie and Nan Being productive. joined us. Welcome. We're glad you're with us, everybody. Awesome. Yep. Thank you for joining in. Right. Vicar Christian. All right, Z. Pastor Scott, Zach. Welcome, hopefully, guys. the uh, the okay, folks from Valero will be able to join us as well. So I hope so too. That'd be great to have them join us. Yeah, it would yep. be awesome. Thanks for joining. Us. Good group of folks. Vicar Christian. All right, Z. Pastor Scott. Zach, I know you probably feel a little cheated since you're missing Valero out on your join us as well. normally I awesome lunch you get so over there. Too. You know what? They do such a great job, awesome. and uh, they are so hospitable. It is uh, a lot of fun to go and teach Bible class there once a month, and I am very disappointed. But hey, I'm glad that at least we can be together virtually. <laughs> That's right. Uh, let's see. Let me get this so I can see that. However, there's no virtual food, which is a little disappointing because it is good. No virtual food. No virtual food. You can't quite replicate that. All right, so see Lanny and Kay, welcome. Glad to have you here. Randy Lynn, I see them on the Concordia site. Welcome guys. Kara, Teresa, welcome. I'm glad you guys are with us. So Zach, what do you think? Because, we, uh, because we're at a little bit different time, shall we give it just a few minutes before we get started? Uh, you know what? Uh, the, the good news is um, when, when, I, when I teach this study at Valero at this time, uh, it's supposed to start at 11.45 and we usually start about 11.50. So it's, uh, yeah, we, we, got, we got a couple of minutes. So it works. And then I go along. Um, it's really kind of a shock to everybody in the room. <laughs> Yeah, surprising to me, of course. Yeah, of course it is. See, Robert Phillips, Pastor Nordley, welcome, guys. Dwayne and Maricela, welcome. Matthew Preston. Hey, Matt. Hey, the, the stuff that you set up to, for me today will work perfectly, Matt. Thanks for your hard work on that. We got a lot of people who are working real hard behind the scenes to make all of this work. And it's, uh, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, a. Uh, every time I turn around, I, you know, I hesitate to even thank people in specific because we're bound to miss somebody because there are so many folks who are working so hard and doing such a great job. Yeah. I see my sweetheart just joined. Hi, hon. And Irma, welcome, Irma. Glad to have you with us. And Betty just joined. Welcome, Betty. Hey, Pastor TJ, you want to pop on for just a second since you're behind the scenes there? Yep. Gone but not forgotten. Gone but not forgotten. Thank you. Thanks for all the things you're doing to make this work. Yeah, my pleasure. And Thank I think you. I think you've got some ideas for how to make it even a little bit better in the in the coming days. So that's kind yep. of cool. Yeah, we were working on that today, and, and hopefully we can test that out here in one of the next two studies. It'll be great. So it won't be, it won't be a change for anybody accessing the Bible study. It'll just be a change in terms of how you're presenting it and, and making it available, right? Exactly. Yeah, it'll be a change on our end. Yep, they'll still get it on the, on the site and on Facebook. Yep. Yep. See, Sue B. All right. Welcome, Sue B. Pastor Tucker, we have a uh, username by the name of Packer Backer on the site. Does that? Okay, thank you for bringing that to my attention. I saw it. I was <laughs> trying to ignore it. Okay. This is a Bible study. We're all friends here, TJ. I'll head out. Good talking to you guys. <laughs> so uh, he pops on just long enough to stir the pot and cause just trouble. Just to torment me, and then away he goes. Welcome, Packer Backer. You're welcome. We're glad you're here. You know what that's called? There be no bears, Packer trash talk. Uh, that is called grace. That is very gracious. There you go. Let's 
So Zach, about one minute <clears throat> and we'll, we'll All right. get started. And hopefully, depending on how it goes, we'll have a few minutes uh, for folks to ask some questions or uh, sort of explore this a little bit further with us. Yeah, it, it, so if, if I don't talk too long, uh, the way you can ask questions uh, at the end of the study is you can comment on our website, concordia.cc, if you're streaming from there, or just comment right there on Facebook, and then uh, Pastor TJ will push those questions to us to make sure that we see them and get them, and we will answer as many of those as you can, and hopefully that'll help us understand what we're studying a little bit better. So one of the, and one of the things, if you're, if you're watching online in the Concordia uh, website, you see the picture and then to the side, there's a box. And at the bottom of that box, it says chat notes schedule. And if you click on the chat, that's where, that's where we'll bring up the chat box. You may need to enter a username. And again, you can use something crazy like Packerbacker, or you can use uh, your real name, whatever you want. But uh, that's how you engage in the chat on the website. But yeah, we'd love to do that. In fact, let's, uh, let's just try a little something. Okay. So if you're watching, uh, are you watching from work? Or at home, or somewhere else. Just uh, just throw that in the in the comments or in the chat line. Just let's see how it works, and we can maybe get used to picking up some of those questions as they scroll by. Great. You're sitting in your backyard. Let us know wherever it is you are. You know, it's an amazingly beautiful day today, but it's humid. Yes, it is. It is. It was. And you and I were up here. Yeah, go ahead. I think you're going to say the same thing. I, I was, yes. <laughs> I, I have a feeling we were both getting our exercise in this morning. And uh, when I went for my run, um, yeah, it was more like a swim. Well, we were doing some filming this morning as, as well. And it was, it was a little warm in that uh, sport coat. Yes, it was. The suffering we endure for our beloved family, right? <laughs> <laughs> So, Zach, let's, let's get started. Folks, welcome to the Isolation Bible Study. Uh, this is a, a Bible study. The, I, the name comes from something that was started by Dave Madden, a dear friend of ours. He's been doing Isolation uh, Church on the Sunday mornings. Does an excellent job and has had some amazing guests, and even some of our worship arts folks have been on there. But we decided, it, with his permission, to use the name because, for many of us, we are in isolation. This is COVID exile that we're going through. And we're doing this Bible study on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Now, this week, the time has changed just a little bit because of the things that are going on. So today, we're starting a little early because Zach normally does a Bible study for our, our dear friends at Valero. And uh, this is a chance to sort of combine the two efforts, do this study and have them join us and uh, do it for the rest of the folks who are part of it. But I also want to make you aware, and I've seen it has been posted but the Isolation Bible Study will begin at 11.15 on Friday. Remember, it's Good Friday, and we're going to, to dig into the, the crucifixion and talk about Good Friday, and then that will roll right into our Tenebrae service. And I'm really excited for that, Zach. It's, it's one of the favorite services of the year over and over again. And so what we've done is, is take some parts, added some parts from this year, and taken some of the favorite parts from previous years, and with the amazing magic that Ryan can do, put it all together. And I think it's going to be an amazing blessing, a wonderful, wonderful service for people. But before we get to that on Friday, I want to remind folks that we'd also love to have them join us on Thursday. You want to tell them about Monday, Thursday? Yeah. Sure. So Monday, Thursday, uh, first of all, let's just uh, figure out what in, the word, what in the world the word Monday is. It's not Monday, but Monday. And uh, it's a Latin word that means command. And so the night before Jesus goes to the cross, he gives his disciples a couple of commands. One is all about how we treat each other and how we live out our faith, which is we love one another as Jesus has first loved us. And so Jesus gives his disciples the night before he goes to the cross, kind of, kind of his last wish. Uh, yep. is that his disciples would love one another. And then the other command that he gives them is after he shares the Passover meal and he takes some bread and says, this is my body and takes a cup of wine and says, this is my blood. He says, do this in remembrance of me. And so this has been a meal now that, that Christians, uh, ever since that last supper, uh, Christians have been celebrating the Lord's Supper. And so that's what that night is all about as we reflect on those, on those last moments before Jesus went to the cross. If you are a part of our Concordia family, I'd encourage you to take a look on the Facebook page uh, for, the, 
for a video that talks about how to prepare for Monday, Thursday service. There's also, you'll be receiving an e-newsletter with more information about that. Uh, but that's, that's going to be a wonderful celebration. And I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. It's, it's very, very special. You know, last week we began our Wednesday study talking about Psalm 91. And the reason that we were focused on Psalm 91 is because it's a, it's a Psalm that, that the uh, Young Life Group began praying back when there was an Ebola outbreak a few years ago that you no doubt will remember. And they began praying and God intervened in a miraculous way. And so we heard about that. In fact, uh, uh, Young Life is also doing it again for this COVID-19 outbreak. And we thought, what a, great, what a great kind of movement within the Christian faith to be a part of. And so we've been asking our Concordia family to pray Psalm 91 each and every day. And we thought it might make it more meaningful if we would dig in on one of the days of the Bible study, dig into Psalm 91. And we'll move on to other things over the course of the time as, as this goes on. But Psalm 91 is awesome. And Zach, last weekend, or last Wednesday, you brought out just an amazing depth about this psalm, but, but really, we've just begun. And so to, to start today, Zach, if you'll lead us in prayer, and then we're going to actually flip back from Psalm 91 to Psalm 90 to actually understand our context. But will you pray for us as we start? Sure, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for today, and we are grateful to be together even while we're apart. We're thankful for all the amazing technology that allows a Bible study like this even to happen. And we're thankful that your word endures throughout the ages and all the promises and all the hope that it brings, especially at a moment and in a time like this, belong to us because of what Jesus has done. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. So dear friends, to, to understand, and I'm not going to steal the punchline for this Bible study, but to, to, to sort of get perspective, we need to move from Psalm 91 back to Psalm 90. And instead of reading all of Psalm 90 to start with, we're going to kind of move through it verse by verse. So the context is that this is actually uh, a psalm that, that from Moses in the wilderness, right? It's not, yes. it's not a, the traditional in that it was written by uh, David or written by Solomon. But let's begin in verse 1 and, and sort of let you bring out the insight that goes along with this, it basically begins with a confession of faith. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You know, Zach, when I, when I read those verses, it makes me think of that wonderful section in Ephesians chapter one, where it talks about how before the foundation of the world was laid, God chose us to be his beloved children, essentially. But uh, talk to me about this. So verses one and two, what do you see there? So uh, we see a couple of different things here. Uh, let's start here. One of the reasons that we know this was written by Moses, uh, this is a, a little extra nugget for you Bible nerds. Uh, if you notice right under the Psalm, uh, Psalm 90, it says a prayer of Moses, the man of God. And these were added to the Psalms literally hundreds, if not thousands of years ago. And these are what are called superscriptions so that we actually know who wrote these Psalms and, and maybe why they wrote them. And so the biblical authors themselves are concerned about giving us background information and trying to keep everything as accurate and historical as possible. And that's where these superscriptions came from. Now, in these couple of verses, we get really two things. We get a what and we get a why. A lot of scholars think that when Moses wrote this, the Israelites were in the wilderness. They had been rebelling against God. And so kind of like God uh, sent plagues against the Egyptians when they rebelled against him, he now sends a plague against the Israelites, which is a plague of snakes. They're in the middle of the wilderness. Some snakes show up. They begin to bite the Israelites and the Israelites are poisoned. And many of them, many of them pass away. And so just look at it like this. They're in the middle of a pestilence and it's scary. Kind of like we're in the middle of a pestilence. You know, I have to say that, that COVID-19 is scary. But the whole idea of snakes by the boatload roaming around and biting people is maybe even more terrifying than COVID-19. Uh, kind, of kind of the way to think of it is this is a scene straight out of Indiana Jones, right? Yeah, w believe me, that scene has been the subject of nightmares for me for a long time. And I saw, I saw that movie years and years ago. So they're in the midst of this pestilence. 
It sets the context as we move on into Psalm 91. And again, I'm, I'm shocked, Zach, but are you going with three points today? Is that, is that what I'm seeing here? I am. I am. Now, uh, but, but before we do the three points, the, the two points in verses one and two, the what, this is, this is who God is. He's our dwelling place. But the reason he's able to be our dwelling place is in verse two which is exactly what you mentioned when it comes to the Ephesians passage. Before the mountains were born, you brought forth the whole world. Here's the idea. Because God made the whole world, he controls the whole world, he's above and beyond the whole world. And so no matter what pestilence we face, he can be our dwelling place. If we didn't have verse two, that God made the whole world, that he has the power over the whole world, The promise of verse one would almost ring a little bit hollow because then it's just God trying to protect us. But when God has control over the whole world, you can take the promise to the bank that he doesn't just try to protect us. He will protect us. But in order to deeply understand that promise, we need to understand these three points, right? All right. So point number one, life is Finite. Thanks for beginning with such a hopeful, happy point. (laughs) Life is finite. Yes, it is. And uh, we get this first point uh, just by looking at verses three through six. Um, You turn people back to dust, saying, return to dust, you mortals. A thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by, or like a watch in the night. You sweep people away in the sleep of death. They are like the new grass of the morning. In the morning, it springs up new, but by evening, it is dry and withered. Now, uh, that's one of those very picturesque things that the Bible gives us. Uh, The picture that it borrows from is actually all the way back to Genesis. After Adam and Eve uh, commit the first sin, God says to Adam, "Here's, here's part of the curse, right? Dust you are, and to dust you shall return. And so in verse 3, Notice uh, the Israelites say to God, you're turning people back to dust and you're saying, return to dust, O sons of men. Or verse five, you sweep men away in the sleep of death. They are like the new grass of the morning. And so uh, the way to think about this is uh, you actually ask people to send some pictures of their gardens right now because they're so beautiful Mm -hmm. because of all all the rain. They're beautiful now. Just wait until July, right? Right. Well, it's also interesting, Zach, to think about. So in verse 1, it's talking about how God is our dwelling place, which reminds us of what's coming up in in Psalm 91, where God is our refuge, right? But God is our dwelling place. And then it talks about, in verse 2, how God is everlasting. But in verse 3, there's this stark contrast. While God is everlasting, he has no beginning or end. We, O mortals, uh, uh, sons of men, We are anything but immortal. We're finite. But even then in the middle of this kind of dark point, uh, notice verse four, where uh, Moses says, for a thousand years in your sight or like a day that has just gone by or like a watch in the night. And so here's the idea, because God is everlasting, he will outlast you and me, Uh, which is kind of good when you think about it. Uh, be, because think about your family, the people you grew up with, your mom, your dad. One of the ways that they could be a blessing to you if they chose to be was that they could take all the stuff that they had learned because they were further down the road of life and impart it to you. One of the things that you want to do for your kids is impart the same thing to them. And so the fact that someone would be before us to raise us, to love us, to pour into us, that's a huge blessing. And so the psalmist says, well, okay, God is way before us for like a thousand years or in a cider, just like a day. But of course, he isn't just before us, he's also after us, which is why Christians believe in the promise of eternal life. Not only does he, you know, impart a bunch of wisdom to us because he's been around for a really, really long time, even after our lives have ended, he is still there for us. And so we may be mortal, But right in the middle of this is a statement of God's immortality, which when mortality kind of presses in and presses down on us, it's really comforting to know that death ain't coming for God. Well, and that's when you think about that in practical terms, 
So we have a God who is immortal. We have a God who is, is all loving. And we have a God who is all powerful. That's kind of the trifecta, right? Because we have this God who loves us passionately, wants to be with us, does not want to be separated from us, not separated from us spiritually, and not separated from us by death. And so with that perspective and that trifecta of God's amazing qualities, it, it helps us look forward with hope. Even though our bodies will die, all of we will be swept away in the sleep of death, God doesn't leave that as the final word because he's almighty, he's eternal, he's, and he is also loving, passionate about you and me, his children. So life is finite. It's a tough point, but you know what? Um, it's something we need to remember because it points us toward God's infiniteness. So point two. Point two, sin has consequences. I think we've covered this point before. Yes, we have. And so look at verse 7 of Psalm 90. Uh, here's what Moses says. We're consumed by your anger, O God. We're terrified by your indignation. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. All our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. Our days may come to 70 years or 80 if our strength endures. Yet the best of them are but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. Now, now notice, Moses gives us a couple of problems that sin does when it comes to our lives. N number one, um, sin literally gives us a promise with life. And this is why we are finite. Life is, is, is finite. Uh, this is why Moses can say in, in verse 10, our days may come to 70 years or 80 if our strength endures. We have trouble with life. There's going to come a time when life is going to kind of get the best of us. But not only do we have trouble with life, we have trouble in life. We moan. We have trouble. This is the second half of verse 10. We have sorrow. And so that's all the result of sin. Now, that's scary, but here's what I want you to remember. If you know that, if you believe that, then sin kind of comes with a pattern. And if you just watch, you can begin to see the pattern. Uh, this is a psalm that is written by Moses, and uh, it's written for the Israelites when they're having a lot of trouble with sin. They're rebelling against God. They're not listening to what he says. And now they have problems with snakes. It's a disaster. But this sin psalm has consequences, also, right? Yeah, sin has consequences. But, but here's the other <laughs> thing about this psalm. This psalm was also used by the Israelites when they were carried off into exile in Babylon. And if you've been with me at the Valero Bible study over the past few months, uh, you probably know all about this exile uh, by now because we've been studying a book called the, the, called the Book of Esther which actually takes place uh, after the Israelites have been carried off into exile. Uh, the basic story goes like this. The Israelites were continuing to sin. God sends these prophets, and the prophets say, hey, trouble's going to come if you don't knock it off. That's kind of a paraphrase. And, and the Israelites don't knock it off. And so uh, the Babylonians come in, and they destroy the city of Jerusalem. They carry off a lot of people. And that's when the Israelites kind of almost rediscovered the psalm. And they began to, to re-sing this psalm, trusting that God is their dwelling place, but also knowing, holy smokes, we, we have messed this up and the pattern of sin has repeated itself in our lives and it has the same effects every time. But I love what happens as we move on in this psalm because it doesn't leave us in, in that terrible place. Moses uh, knows God, and he knows God's promises, and he knows his love for his people. The Holy Spirit inspires us in such a way that we face the, the reality that we are finite, and we face the, the, the truth that there are consequences to our sin. But I love what happens in verse 12. Yeah. Uh, Moses says, teach us to number our days, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Um, if you grew up in church, maybe you've heard this verse before. Maybe you've used this verse before. Maybe you've memorized this verse. This is really, in some sense, the turning point in the psalm. Because here's finally what, what Moses is doing. He makes a request to God. So far, he's just been talking about, okay, what God has done. What God has done in response to their sin. And now he says to God, 
all right, God, we need some help. And here's my first request. Just help me to remember that I am finite. Help me to remember that my sin has consequences. Because when I understand me, that's wisdom. Here's one way to think about it. Um, if you've ever been through a 12-step program, uh, the first step of the 12-step program is always just to admit that you're powerless. And that's, that's what Moses is doing. He's saying, hey, I, I don't have control over my days. Honestly, I don't even have control over myself in a lot of ways. I sin and I sin again. And unless, unless I understand that, I'm never going to be wise like you have called me to be wise. I'm never going to understand like you have called me to understand. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful thought. You know, I think of, I think of how uh, in James chapter one, it talks about if you lack wisdom to ask God who gives liberally, right? He wants us to yeah. know the truth. He wants us to have wisdom to, to understand life and to understand ourselves and to be able to, to come to that point of humble repentance where we, we, we no longer are infatuated with our own gifts or abilities or the people around us. And we recognize we're broken. And we need, we need the hope that comes only through the love of our God and his son, Jesus Christ. So that moves us to verses 13 through 17 then, right? Yeah. And so Moses kind of continues his, his request here, okay? Uh, first, he says, just God, help me to understand me. But then he says, God, I really need you. Relent, Lord, how long will it be? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love. And again, if you grew up in church, you may have learned this as like steadfast love, everlasting love, that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, for as many years as we have seen trouble. May your deeds be shown to your servants, your splendor to their children. May the favor, and by, by the way, the Hebrew word there for favor is the word for grace. May the grace of the Lord our God rest on us, establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Um, here's what Moses is saying. Um, there's only one answer to our sin. And the answer is not just banging us up against the head until we get better. It's not just God wagging his finger and saying, try harder next time. There's only one answer to our sin. And the answer is everlasting love. The answer is in verse 17, favor, or as the Hebrew would put it, grace. You know, isn't that, isn't that just the beauty of God's word? That, that these Psalms written eons before the Gospels, eons before Paul's writing, and yet we have, we have this connection where it talks about God's favor that rests upon us, that that's our hope. God's grace is our hope. And then we think about Paul's words in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, that, that famous verse that all of our confirmants memorize, it, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. The, the message of the scripture is unified because the, the, the subject matter of the scripture is unified. It's God's love for us in Jesus Christ, our hope through the salvation he promised all the way back in the Garden of Eden, long before Moses, God promised his grace that he would deliver us, that he would accomplish what we could never do for ourselves. In fact, it's interesting because in verse 17, after Moses says, may the grace or favor of our Lord God rest on us, then he makes a final request, which is just establish the work of our hands. Establish the work of our hands. He says it, he says it twice. And, and, and the idea is, is this. The works that we do only flow from the grace that God gives. We don't work to get grace. We work because we already have grace. And so all that stuff that, that you do, if you're doing good stuff, especially in this pandemic time where people are in dire need, I want to say thank you. Yeah. But, but remember, remember, you're an ambassador of God. He's the one who's sending you out to do that. And God doesn't love you any more or any less if you do an awesome job or if you make a mistake, his love is solid and that can lead you to work with freedom because now you're not always freaked out that maybe you're going to do it just a little wrong. God's grace covers that. Isn't that the beautiful thing? 
It's not about our perfection. It's not about us getting it right, having all the answers. It's about this incredible God who loves us in spite of and through our faults and flaws, who washes away our sin to draw us close to himself. But, but there's a problem here, Zach. Yeah. So verse 17 is the end of Psalm 90. Yeah. You've only done two points, and you said you had three this morning. Oh, yes. Okay, so we eventually have to get back to Psalm 91, right? It'd be a good idea. Which, which, is, which is what the end of Psalm 90 takes us to. Because Psalm 90 makes a request. Psalm 91 makes the request happen. Uh, because if you were with us a week ago, um, we looked at the very first word of Psalm 91. Psalm 91 verse 1. And the very first word is he. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. And the question is, who is the he? Who is the he in the psalm? And, and, and we, we found the answer just by looking down a little bit to Psalm 91, verses 11 and 12, where, where it says, for he, that's God right there, will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift up uh, they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Now, now these words, um, they're not just spoken in Psalm 91. They're, they're spoken in the New Testament. They're, they're spoken in the Gospels um, by Satan to Jesus. Interestingly enough, when he's in the wilderness, just like the Israelites are in Psalm 90. And when he's enduring trials, just like the Israelites are in Psalm 90. And what Satan does is he, is he tries to use these words in the wrong way. But what we discovered last Wednesday was that even if he uses them in the wrong way, he speaks them to the right person. Because Psalm 91, ultimately, Jesus is the he of Psalm 91 verse 1, which means, here's finally our third point. That's a pretty long ramp up to the third point. Uh, but it means <laughs> that, that Jesus is the answer to Moses' request. And Jesus is the answer to your request too. Love it. I mean, it's, it, it just lays it out there. Beautifully done, Zach. Beautifully done. So we've got a few minutes left. Mm -hmm. uh, shall we take a few questions? Sure. Because TJ just forwarded a question here, and it says, uh, is the promise for the church today, if my people, which are called by my name, humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear, hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land, from Second Chronicles 7, 14. What do you think? Um, so, in one sense, the answer is no. But kind of yes. So whenever you, uh, whenever you look at a verse like this, you always want to look at the verses around the verses. And so this is right after Solomon has finished building the temple. All right. And King Solomon, he was a great king in the Old Testament. He was a son of David, who was another great king in the Old Testament. And the Lord appears to Solomon at night and says, I've heard your prayers and I've chosen this place, the temple, for myself as a temple for sacrifices. And then, and then kind of, God kind of drops the hammer. He says, when I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command locusts to devour the land or, or send a plague among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal, will heal their land. And so notice here kind of in context, the people that God is talking about, um, it's very specifically uh, the people of Israel, his nation. And this is like all about the temple and about sacrifices. And, and God's kind of point is, don't just think that because you got the temple and sacrifices, if you're totally rebelling against me and sinning, don't think, kind of like with Moses, kind of like with the exile, kind of like with Psalm 90 and 91, don't think that there aren't consequences to your sin. And so repent. And so immediately, this is spoken to Israel. Now, by extension... Yeah, that's I like the fact that you said kind of, because yeah. it's, not, it's not directed to us in a general way, but... But guess what? 
God had a people in the Old Testament and God has a people in the New Testament. And so here's, here's the idea. If you follow Jesus, if you trust in him, if his name is on you, well, the same thing applies to you, no matter how far you've fallen, okay? When you humble yourself, when, when, when you pray and seek his face, right? Uh, then you will get a response from God. It's kind of like Psalm 91, right? Psalm 91 is, is for us, but it's for us only after it goes through Jesus. Second Chronicles 7 verse 14 is, is for us, but it's for us only after it goes through Jesus, because he's the sacrifice that completes all of those sacrifices that are being talked about in Second Chronicles 7. So, Zach, if, if folks were wanting to, to dig in, if, if they're really enjoying sort of understanding the heart of Psalm 90 and Psalm 91, and they wanted to do some of that on their own, where would you point them? What are some great resources for that? Um, so there are a couple of, if you just kind of like the Psalms and you want to do a, a devotional on the Psalms, there's a great book um, by Tim Keller. He, he's an author that we recommend a whole bunch. Uh, he great used to people. be a, a pastor at a church in New, New York City, and he has a little devotion uh, book on the Psalms. And honestly, off the top of my head, I cannot remember the name, uh, I think but it's I, I believe it's Songs of Jesus. The Songs of Jesus. The yeah. Songs of Jesus. Yeah. And, and if, you, if you want to pick that up and just use that as a daily devotional for a while, you'll be blessed by that. Now, another excellent way, comment. Yeah. The Songs of Jesus is available in a Kindle version and, and probably other ebooks as well. So if you can't get to a bookstore, you still can download that great book. Yes, you can. Now, the other commentary that's really excellent and very accessible, not hard to read, uh, it's called Psalms for you. If you just go to Amazon and search Psalms for you, it'll pop right up. And it doesn't cover all the Psalms, just so you know, but it covers a lot of the Psalms. And uh, here's, here's what I like about that commentary. It runs them all through Jesus. Uh, the author of that book has this commitment that really the Bible at its heart is all about Jesus. Yeah, love that. Love that. So I, I'm not seeing other questions, Zach. Um, looks like we left a little time for questions and maybe we don't need it because you were so amazingly lucid. Uh, you've answered every possible question. Thanks be to God. You forgot long-winded. <laughs> well, I'm just going to save that for later on. Okay. Um, so let's talk about what's going to happen on Friday then. Okay. Let's, okay. let's move forward. We're, next Wednesday, we'll come back and, and dig into Psalm 91 a little bit more. There's some more meat that we want to pull out of this. It may be a week or maybe two, again, depending on how long-winded you are. But uh, That's true. we'll do Psalm 91 next Wednesday. But Friday is one of those amazing days, and there is so much richness and so much to understand about Good Friday and the fact that it's at the heart of, of the whole scripture, the heart of, of the history of the world, right? That, yep. that there's a lot we can dig into. So we're going to start at 1115. Yep. And we will wrap up in time for the noon service that will begin at noon. So yep. any any sort of foreshadowing about that? Well, uh, so we'll probably spend a little bit of time just talking about the cross, because there's some work that's been done on that. And when you begin to understand the sacrifice that Jesus made for our sins, um, you go, whoa, but here's the thing, if all you do is dig into, okay, here's the pain and here's the agony that Jesus went through, it's just gruesome. But if you understand what was happening, not only physically to Jesus, but, but spiritually, right? The victory that he was winning or the price that he was paying, the death that he was dying is supposed to be the, the, the one that we die and he, he dies it for us. Um, it becomes, it goes from gruesome to absolutely incredible. And so really there are two mistakes sometimes that people make with Good Friday. Uh, they never think deeply about the price that Jesus paid. And so they never realize, oh, wow, this is heavy stuff. But then the other mistake that people make is they get so wrapped up in the heavy stuff that they forget that there's a reason that we call it not Bad Friday, not Awful Friday, not Hopeless Friday, but Good. Friday. And so we'll tease both sides of that out coming up this Friday. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. I think it'll be awesome. Now, let me ask the same question I asked just a moment ago with regard to, to uh, Psalm 91. 
if folks wanted to dig in a little deeper, if they wanted to sort of understand more behind the scenes about Good Friday and take their time uh, in the next few days, what would you suggest? What book would you recommend to them? Oh, my, there are so many good books. Uh, there's a devotional book um, called, I believe, 11 Hours, One Friday Afternoon. Um, and uh, it, it digs in uh, to some of the last words of Jesus, to some of what Jesus had done. In fact, let me make sure I got the title of that book right. Is it 11 hours or is it six hours? It, it, I think it's six hours. I was like, 11 hours is a long time. I'm doing the same thing you're doing. I'm just checking because I'm thinking of, a, of an author, but I can't remember the... Yep. It's six hours, one Friday. Oh, you know what? Max Lucado has a book called Six Hours, One Friday, and Max's stuff is fantastic, but that wasn't the yeah, one I was thinking great, of. That's a great book. Now, that's Max's book is more kind of devotional reading, um, yep. but uh, there, are, there are a number of great books out there. I think N.T. Wright has uh, uh, some, some stuff about Good Friday that would be well worth reading. So we can maybe yeah, try to yeah. post something in the comments here a little later on, because I, I thought I had some books to suggest and they just flew right out of my brain. One other, one other book that we, that we should probably suggest is a, a book called The Cross by uh, John Stott. John Stott oh, yeah. is a terrific author and uh, he, has, he has great work on, uh, on, on, on the death and resurrection of Jesus. And uh, it's called actually The Cross of Christ by John Stott. You know, um, our, our friend in Kalamazoo at Western Michigan, Paul Meyer, uh, he has some great writing on Good Friday and Easter as well, Zach. Uh, what was that called? In the Fullness of Time? Is that the compendium? Oh, yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. In, in, in the Fullness of Time is uh, the compendium. And by the way, Meyer, just, just so if you look it up, you find the right one. Paul Meyer, M-A-I-E-R. And here, here's what Dr. Meyer does. Uh, he goes through actually the Christmas story and the Good Friday and Easter story from a historical perspective. And he looks not only at what the Bible says, but what things outside the Bible say. And he tries to, to give us reasons to believe that all of this actually happened, that Jesus really made the sacrifice the Bible said he made, that Jesus really rose from the dead the way the Bible said he rose. And there's fascinating material in there called The Fullness of Time. Yeah, if you've never read Paul Meyer, uh, you'll be blessed. He's a, an LCMS pastor. Uh, he's been to Concordia and done lectures before. Tremendous author and great, great inspiration and hope from his writing. Well, it's time to wrap stuff up. And so we look forward to be back together on Friday. By the way, we're going to we'll do the Bible study at eleven fifteen on Friday. We'll also repeat that Bible study. You can you can access it uh, through a YouTube channel, and I know that they'll post a link to that later on. But we will also play that Bible study before the Good Friday service uh, at seven o'clock. So it'll start at six fifteen and take us right into the uh, Good Friday service on Friday evening as well. So Zach, uh, how about if I pray for us today? Great. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity. It's amazing to think that we can be gathered with friends and family and, and maybe even brand new friends through this medium and talk about your word, understand not only the truth about our brokenness, but the amazing truth of your grace and forgiveness through your son, Jesus Christ. Bless us as we continue to walk through this Holy Week. Strengthen us, Lord, and prepare us as we observe that amazing day when your son gave his life for us and all of that in preparation for the day that guarantees our hope, Easter. Lord, we lift all of this to you, all of our friends and family and loved ones who are online with us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you, everybody. I hope you have a great rest of your Wednesday.